Hello Internet, my name is Mark and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, I'm happy to have you and hopefully this video will be helpful. My name is Mark, I'm currently an upcoming junior or third year student at NYU, double majoring in computer science and language in mind with a minor in game design and I'm hoping to graduate a semester early but we'll see how it works out. I started this channel and wanted to upload to it when I first went to NYU and um, I have gotten some questions as the videos kind of came along and I wanted to also talk about some questions that I had when I was first entering NYU and with the semester coming up, unfortunately a lot of it is online. I figured I would answer some questions if you're looking into NYU if, because application season's coming up or if you're going to NYU this year and you're wondering about, you know, different things. So I go to NYU CAS. Some of the questions I will address Tandon and Tish to the extent that I know them, but they work very differently. So keep in mind, I go to CAS, that's where I'm doing my double major because I couldn't double with Tandon and CAS, it was too complicated. I really wanted to do both majors. But anyway, without further ado, let's get right into the questions I've gotten from comments and emails. Do I believe it's possible to complete a double major without any AP credits? The short answer is yes. The long answer is it depends on the major combination. Essentially at NYU and different schools work differently, you need 128 credits to graduate and your average class offers four credits. NYU with your default tuition gives you 18 credits, right? So a normal course load is three to four classes. Four I believe is on the higher end, but anyway, you take four, four credit classes and you get 16 credits out of the way. 16 credits every semester and you're good. You have 128 by the time you're ready to graduate in four years. When it comes to the majors though, each major has its own class requirements. For example, computer science, you're required to take calculus one, discrete mathematics. You also have to take any core classes that are required of you and whatever requirements are from that second major. Personally, I'm pursuing two majors because AP Psych tested me out of an intro to psych class, also kind of toward the major. Computer science, AP computer science and AP calculus counted towards the major as well and also AP biology got me out of my science core requirement. Another question is one I got recently and it was, what is your opinion of computer science at NYU? I hear it's a bit watered down. These days, computer science is watered down everywhere, dare I say. Personally, I kind of I was surprised, you know, in the computer science requirements, it says calculus one and discrete mathematics were the only ones you needed. I've taken linear algebra and I've taken calculus two, but you don't need those for computer science. Other engineering schools and Tandon are totally different requirements, but in essence, CS is a little watered down, but that's not really NYU specific. However, I have enjoyed it a lot because you get to focus on very specific computer science classes, if you'd like, that are not too math heavy, but they can get there. All in all, be prepared for a little math, but don't expect to drown in it. And if you do love math, uh, I believe up to two math courses, such as me taking calculus two and linear algebra count towards the computer science major. Speaking of the computer science major, someone asked why apply to CAS versus Tandon. Personally, uh, Tandon is a lot more math based, a lot more engineering based, which a lot of people would be looking for. For me, I knew I wanted to double major. Originally that was psychology, but I couldn't double major with Tandon and CAS. I think you technically can, but it would be intensely confusing and annoying because Tandon is in Brooklyn and CAS is in Manhattan. So for me, CAS was the clear option. It's a liberal arts school. They offer the core requirements. It's everything I kind of needed to do for both my majors without things becoming too complicated. There was another question about, should I save my core classes for a lesser, you know, less intense time at the end of my college career? No, <laughs> the core classes, while they may sound easy, are definitely not easy, especially if you aren't passionate about the topic. For example, I signed up for text and ideas my first semester and apparently it's one of the harder ones. I didn't realize that I didn't have to do it my first semester. I thought I had to do it. That aside, I got one of the last slots and it was called Autobiographies of the Self and the description was like we read seven autobiographies throughout the semester and we write about them. So I was sitting there like oh boy this is gonna suck. I really enjoyed it. It was very philosophical based, taught by a comparative literature professor. You'll find that each core class is taught by a different you know department and I'm taking Cultures and Context Australia this upcoming semester taught by an anthropology professor. So so where you can make your core classes as specific to like your major or your interests as you can, but balance them out with your courses. Don't assume that because they're core classes, they're easy to do. Also, you definitely don't want to be left with uh, your last two semesters and having forgotten to do one of your core requirements. When it comes to your major path, just know which classes you need to take first and second. For example, I couldn't take operating systems before computer systems organization. So you don't want to leave, you know, taking some class during some semester without realizing you need another class to take. 
take it. One of the questions asks, how are the science professors? Do they teach and you just have to study and be okay when test day comes? Are the classes okay? From my experience, I have had very good and not so good STEM professors. However, most of them have been fantastic. When it comes to the language and mind courses I've taken, all the professors have been much more eccentric. And I think one of the big things there is that there's a fine balance between someone who's very good at teaching and doesn't know their material and someone who really knows their material but isn't good at teaching. And the best professors are in the middle of that uh, kind of zone, if not, you know, at the peak of both zones. However, the main thing behind this question that I want to tackle is, do you just have to study and be okay when test day comes? Try to take classes you're interested in. It will help you in the long run. I know that's easy to say, especially if you're pursuing maybe a major you don't really want to pursue for outside reasons, but uh, don't just study and, you know, think that when test day comes, you'll be fine. If you don't show up to classes, you are putting yourself at a major disadvantage. I've never pulled an all-nighter, at least not for any school-related reason. And whether that be a humble brag or not, I believe that's because I show up to classes. This gets you, you know, your professor sees you consistently. They know who you are. When you go to office hours, what you should do and ask questions if you don't understand things. A professor wants to see you at office hours before the exam asking questions rather than after the exam and asking for a better grade. Granted, I'm not a professor. I just can imagine, you know, that would be a better thing to see. Um, go to recitation, go to your lectures because just showing up, take notes, of course, but passively absorbing the material will give you a much, much better idea of what is going to be on the test, what you are going to be learning in the course versus just studying the textbook. My cognitive neuroscience professor has this fantastic graphic on his slide. You do not need to read a textbook front to back. You can if you want, and I would encourage you to do it properly. There's a video here by Marty Lobdell on how to study efficiently and use textbooks efficiently. But if you're just studying for exams, you know, you're, you're in a class you don't really want to be in. For example, let's say I wasn't enjoying the text and ideas class that I took. Did not intensively study for that class because the exams were based on the books. All I did was read the book. It was a good amount of reading and sometimes I didn't do the reading, but I just read the books and I showed up to class and I took notes in class. And when I just read over my notes, you know, and looked on the test, granted the format was very easy, because I had read the book. You know, it's not the same for all classes. For math, you know, know the chapters that are relevant to your piece sets you're assigned and do the practice problems. If you just read the textbook front and back and don't practice, you're not gonna learn anything. And that's what I learned in my Calc 2 class and my discrete math classes. It was a wake up call. <laughs> so on that line of just showing up, someone asked what happens if you do not hand in your homework? My CSO class had optional homework and I made the mistake of not submitting the first half of the year assignments, which were written in C. There were also labs, but that's, you know, if you're interested more about that, you can check out my uh, computer systems organization in a month video. I didn't do those first half of the homeworks because I felt comfortable with, you know, writing C code. And the professor said that if you hand in your homework, I might bump up your grade half a grade. But I thought the second half of the year would be a lot more homeworks than there were. And I would say like there were three or four homework assignments for assembly, which I did do versus the 10 or 15 that were for C. Anyway, two reasons to do your homework. First of all, some classes do require it. For linguistics, we had a small paper due every single week that took me, you know, an hour tops aside from the reading we might have had to do. And while it was only 10% of the grade or something, doing it helps you study. It helps you learn the material. I should have done the C code anyway, even if I felt confident with it because it helps test me anyway. Homework is like studying that keeps you more accountable. If you don't hand in your homework, and you're going to hear this a lot from parents and teachers, no one's going to be like, hey, you didn't hand in your homework. Uh, give it to me tomorrow and I'll give you, you know, half off. Some professors will do this. They'll say, if your homework is a day late, I'll take 10 points off for every day it's late. After five days, you don't get any credit. But no one is going to say, hey man, I didn't get your homework assignment. And then you're going to get your transcript back and uh, you're going to have, you know, a 50 in your homework grade and you're going to regret not handing in your homework. So do it for the grade, but also do it to learn. The P sets that we did in Calc 2 were so relevant to the, the tests. The tests were pretty much a compilation of the homework assignments. So do your homework for more reasons than one. And lastly, does NYU have parties? As far as I know, every college has parties. I'm not a very extroverted person, uh, but you know, you're in New York and I see people dressing up and going out all the time. So short answer is yes. So those are the questions I was asked coming in. If you're curious about how, you know, early graduation works that I mentioned, or perhaps more about class participation, uh, keep on watching for the video. But really quick, I want to get into some speculation about how online classes will work. I've been learning online for an incredibly long time. I taught myself code online outside of my high school and stuff like that. Fortunately for me, the online format was not too difficult to adapt to. So I wanted to share some tips for any incoming NYU students or anyone else who has stumbled across this video. How they worked when I was in Paris was how I presume they're going to be working this semester. I would wake up and I would turn on my computer. My professor would either email me a Zoom link or there would be a recurring Zoom meeting. I would join and voila, it was like I was watching a live stream. The difficult thing is, and I faced this for a while, was 
being so distracted. There's no physical people around you or physical professor to keep you accountable for paying attention. So you gotta do that yourself. But when it comes to succeeding in online classes, change up your environment. If you're in your room and you're on your bed with your laptop, go to a table, a desk, anything. Your bed is for sleeping, not for taking notes. Try really, really hard. Put sticky notes around to not get distracted. There were mornings when I picked up Animal Crossing and just played during class. Not good. Note taking is fantastic. I would recommend handwriting your notes, you know, not just to take notes, but to pay attention. Force yourself to keep track of whatever the teacher's saying and you know, write things in your own words. But when it comes to online classes, the biggest thing is to just show up. One thing I'm afraid of and sort of fell into when I came back from Paris was being at home and not really feeling like I was in college. You know, it makes sense. You're at home, you shouldn't be taking classes right now, but you are, and that is the situation. Show up to your classes, make that commitment. Make that your priority. Make it as easy as possible to join your classes. Set up your environment for success. Change up your desk whenever a class starts or something. Doing online classes is pretty difficult and it's the time we're going to have to adapt to. I do want to make a whole video on this because I think I have some useful advice to share, so that might be coming out soon, so stay tuned. So, questions I had when going into NYU, including early graduation and double majoring, that I think would be really useful to people out there. These are the questions that I wish I had answers to when I was entering NYU. How does early graduation work? I have 16 credits going into NYU, so I could graduate a semester early. And early graduation can be done without AP credit. Because I'm doing two majors and a minor, I need a lot of course requirements. While I'll be well over my credit requirement, I need all my core, computer science, language in mind, and game design required courses. It's pretty much that simple. You just have to make sure you have your requirements for your major and stuff, and you have the required amount of credits, as I spoke about earlier. One of the big things for NYU that I was super interested in was taking classes outside of my major and in other schools. For example, animation. That was my key thing for a while. However, right now, the classes that I'm doing that for are called the open arts classes, which is the game design minor. In any school you're in at NYU, you can take up to a maximum of 16 credits of non your school classes. I'm studying computer science and language and mind in CIS. I can take 16 credits of Tisch classes, 16 credits of Tandon classes, or eight credits of Tisch classes and eight credits of Tandon classes. However, I have to take four classes for my game design minor, 16 credits worth, which means that I have to spend 16 credits at Tisch through their open arts. But I declared the minor, so I get 16 more credits to work with if I want to take a course at Tandon or something like that. However, you do need like explicit permission from professors and your advisor, so your advisor will be able to answer all your questions about that, and as long as you push and communicate with your advisor and other professors, you can do it pretty easily. How to study abroad work? I really enjoyed my time in Paris, and although it was cut short, NYU makes study abroad pretty easy but pretty confusing. You send in your application, they get back to you and say whether you're accepted or rejected, and you just have to sort of go with the flow. <laughs> it's not too bad, there's, you know, everyone's also confused. You do have to, you know, book your own flights and stuff, but NYU, I will say, amongst everything that's confusing with them, this is pretty well done. They have their whole system made up, so you have to, you know, there's a checklist to fill out, you put in your flight details, you put in all, you know, how you're going to manage your money, what your housing situation is going to be, and they have housing sites pretty much everywhere there's an NYU site. So it's, it's really well done, and if you want to study abroad, definitely do it. The only thing I would warn is to make sure that you either save your core requirements for a study abroad semester, or make sure there's somewhere that offers your major requirement. For example, I went to Paris and took machine learning, linear algebra, philosophy of language, and phonetics, which was taught in French for my language requirement. I unfortunately can't study abroad again because no other sites offered the courses I need for my major and my minor. However, if I saved like four core classes, then I, I could theoretically go abroad. But keep in mind that you do have to take the language class that is respective to, you know, wherever you're going. So if you're going to Paris, you have to take French. If you're going to Italy, you have to take Italian, so on and so forth. And lastly, what's exam schedule like? Ah! Every class is different. Every class has usually a midterm. Uh, my cognitive neuroscience class and my stats for psych class both had uh, exams intermittently throughout the year, which were all equal weight um, and counted together, although there was a final for stats. For calc and discrete, we had quizzes every Tuesday and a midterm and a final, and that was pretty much it for that. Linguistics, we had a midterm and a final. Cognitive neuroscience, we had four exams. The best of three were taken. They all weighted the same, so there was no specific midterm or final. Stats for psych was very similar, but we did have a final there. And yeah, lastly, participate and do the homework. Uh, when you're studying, it will not help to read the textbook front to back. Uh, you know, you don't want to just skim over your notes. Showing up to class, knowing what the material the teacher is teaching you, the professor is teaching you is so, so important. I remember for my computer 
systems organization class. There were like 10 to 15 kids there. And then I showed up for my midterm and there were like 80 or 90 kids there. Classes haven't necessarily been easy, but when I look at the exam, it's not, nothing's taken me by surprise just because I show up to class and I feel like I can know what to expect. And that is one of the biggest things that I try to tell people is just show up for class. You tell yourself now, you maybe, you know, you can skip here and there or whatever, but just, just show up. 8 a.m. classes are great. They get you up in the morning. Online classes this semester, make a schedule for yourself, change up your environment. If you want to see a video on that, let me know because I think I've got a pretty good system figured out for that. But without further ado, thank you so much for watching. I hope you got something out of this video. And if you have questions, I uh, don't get many comments. So I tend to answer in depth for you if you'd like. Have a good one. Show up to class. And as always, don't forget to stay awesome.